Yeah, we're getting real good at high fives. We're getting really good. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. And we're going to talk to... Uh, uh, we're going to talk about something that's got us tongue twisted and tired and... Oh, man. It's, it, we're going to talk about the election. Yes. The American election, specifically. Which I'm sure that you've never heard of it. I'm sure that you don't know that it's going on. And uh, honestly, it's going to be over. So this episode comes out... Uh, the day before the election. Mm -hmm. yeah, let's uh, be clear. The American election. For those of you in the future listening to the podcast and wondering which election. That's an optimistic perspective on the past. The the Yeah, yeah the, the 2016 American election yeah. between uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and uh, assorted other human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, who we're probably not going to talk about except for that last remark. Mm -hmm. um, and... I want it to be over, but I also just don't know what the world is going to do when it's over. Like, what is news going to be about yeah. once this election is over? I mean, we have a, the optimistic view that it'll start to focus on things that... Ryan, I kind of hope the sun just uh, consumes the earth. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> and here we are yeah. contributing to that by talking about it. It'll expand. Eventually, global warming will be a problem. Thank you, Gary Johnson. <laughs> I was wrong. We're referring to other people already. Yeah. Um, no, of course, we're contributing that by talking about it here uh, because it is a thing to talk about and because we are from Canada. Yeah. So we have a limited perspective on the election, but also a slightly different one. Some of us more limited than others. I am incredibly disconnected this time around. I spend a lot of time reading transcripts of speeches. Yeah. I just, I usually defer to your knowledge on this one. I like transcripts. Yeah. But first, icebreaker. What was your prediction about the American election that you got completely wrong? I I had a, a reasonably um, confident assumption in the wisdom of the masses that I know people tend to make stupid decisions, but I, I thought that the wisdom of the masses would prevail. I honestly did not expect and I predicted that Trump wouldn't have made it out of the primaries. Like, okay. he would make it to the end of the primaries because he's got the funding for it to, to keep himself front and center. But I did not expect the RNC to endorse it. I did not expect the delegates to vote for him. I did not expect for, like, the RNC to approve that. Because I, I guess it's one of those things where the delegates can vote, but the RNC still can, can block it, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know enough about how the Republican Party works because our our political parties work completely differently. Yeah, we don't have primaries like this. It's just why, it, you know, 18 months, right? It's it's a huge, a huge oh ordeal for us. Um so I, my, the prediction I got wrong was I did not think the showdown would be Trump Clinton. I don't know who I didn't predict who would make it out. Um, maybe Cruz, but that's just because the name means more to me. Like I don't know anything about almost any of the candidates, but I know that Cruz was apparently born in Canada. So maybe that's it. <laughs> no, he's not Canadian, but he's born in Canada. So um, yeah, that that prediction. That he would be out just is. I'd, I'd say that you look pretty stupid, except I made the same prediction. Except I was like, no, it's going to be Jeb Bush. Yeah. It's going to be Jeb Bush because Jeb Bush comes from a political dynasty, you know, former governor of Florida. Um, I saw the movie W a long time ago, and I always I always remember that scene where they're like, no, it was supposed to be Jeb. And, and you know, he's sort of that, that like... America's grandpa figure sort of ha hanging out. I guess dad, mm -hmm. but not in like a Tim Kaine America's dad sense. Mm -hmm. um, and that he was going to say some foolish and crazy things and ideally lose, but that he would be the opponent uh, for Hillary Clinton, who was definitely coming into the Democratic primary. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I, I God was I wrong? I, I don't know. I, I think um, it wasn't as a foregone conclusion in my mind. I thought Sanders was going to actually in that regard yeah. i thought the misogyny would no. win out and sanders no. even if he's like on death or he looks like he's on death's doorstep given his age no. not his health but yeah no, you, no. you bernie, didn't see that bernie i i, I believe the, the conversation i had with kyle and and kyle couldn't be here only because he is in he is in uh, our province's capital today um but uh his politics is his thing and he it was bernie sanders is unelectable as president yeah yes um, just too, uh, really, too, really too, too progressive, too uh, yeah. like too, too far forward hmm. 
Um, cause the person you want to be your president is the person who's sort of moderate, who's going to like maintain your status quo and the guy who threatens to, to, to overturn it. Now, right now they've got that campaign going to flip the Senate. Mm -hmm. Now Sanders, Sanders is a baller in the Senate. Okay. <laughs> I could, uh, you know, what? when That's... you, when you put it that way, that makes sense because, um, like I, I feel bad, but I, uh, but, and, and, and I, th I thought he got into it to be like, I'm going to push candidates to the left. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hold the Democratic Party accountable. I'm going to present real opposition mm -hmm. um, and offer a genuine alternative. The things that the Sanders campaign did were incredible. Mm -hmm. The fact that they backed a campaign that nearly took the primary mm -hmm. with grassroots donations and, gra and grassroots effort means a ton. Yeah. Um, like the things that they accomplished cannot be undone. But ever since he announced his candidacy, I was like, there was no way that guy is becoming president. But yeah, my, 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 my assumption was he didn't really want to be. He was going to win by losing. And he, I think, pretty much has. I mean, he, now that he's, like, they, they've really unified behind Hillary Clinton. They've really sort of pushed that, that party unity. He's, he's endorsed her wholly and fully. And... You know, like they there's there's a lot more of that than there is in the in the Republican camp, mm -hmm. um, which I enjoy in the sense that I understand that that is how politics works, and that sometimes you have to back somebody that you like, like when you are a politician, you have to back somebody you don't like, mm -hmm. um, or who six months ago you 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 know deeply vehemently disagreed with on television, mm -hmm. because that is the way the wind blows. Yeah. And it is better that the wind blows that way than the wind blows against you. Yeah. Yeah, you can be uh, enemy combatants on in the, the game field. Once you step off the game field, then yeah. you know, you're supposed to be... Like, you, you bigger, bigger picture, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Which, which, I don't know, that's one of the things I enjoy about politics. I, I know that, that a lot of people find it sort of duplicitous, but I find it sort of deeply honest, is mm -hmm. that, that idea that you at some point have to like lift your head and, and, and look past whatever you're actually competing for to see how this competition fits in with larger competitions and lar and, and larger power structures. And to understand sort of if you're going to be the big fish in the pond, you need to understand what pond you're playing in. Yeah. yeah it reminds me of uh, I'm rewatching again the West Wing and the <laughs> idea of like, eh, they beat us this time. Well, whatever. We're going we're gonna to carry on. Yeah, there's none of that. Like in the pre-show, you mentioned how Trump carries grudges. Like you wouldn't expect that kind of bigger picture thinking. Just in case like he's him. he's watching this, Donald Trump allegedly carries grudges. Sorry, yes. <laughs> but yeah, the the whole idea of like we tried, we 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 didn't we didn't get it this time, but we'll get him next time. So yeah, I mean, of the candidates, I mean, leaving out. Gary Johnson, Jill Stein, and Evan McMullen. Mm -hmm. um, is he the Tiger guy? No, 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 no. Oh, what is the Tiger Why do I not remember the Tiger guy's name? I don't know. I, I don't know. know. Link to the John Oliver <laughs> thing where he talks about the Tiger guy. The man who runs the world's largest tiger, Tiger Zoo, <laughs> who who's gay and who isn't going to wear a suit. Yeah. And he's in debt and he's running for president. It's going to be great. But, uh, no, no. Although, thank you for, for mentioning him. I, I nearly left him out. <laughs> How could I not? No, I mean, I mean, it's, it's obviously Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Everybody knows that. There's no, there's nothing new to say about that. But you mentioned the sort of polarizing nature of this particular election. Mm -hmm. It's, um, so being well-versed in the internet, or at least well-versed enough in the internet, you understand how positions and whatnot get polarized and amplified online, right? Like, usually usually when you get wind of, of say, a social movement or something like that, you're only seeing, like, the most extreme version of it because that's what gets picked up in viral. So look at this example of this hardcore conservative person and what they're saying. Look at what this hardcore mm -hmm. liberal person is saying. And they, they're espousing views that take your ideas that like to the nth extreme, right? Like you, 
you sympathize maybe with the cause, but not like me yeah. being a moderate person, right? Like this is, the, yeah. I often, I often like, I, I, I'm sympathetic, but it's like, I disagree with like the message or the way you're going about it or, or your actions or whatever. But I, I see that you, like you have the high ground, you know, you're morally right or you're, you're kind of politically right about it. Um, so I'm, I'm well versed with how that echo chamber tends to magnify the poles, right? And then the middle gets washed out. But I feel like the, the what happens online and what happens in the media that, you know, sensationalism gets picked up and, and, and amplified and given a platform, that, that's like what has happened, at least in the Trump camp with like the Trump supporters and whatnot. Like it's, it's, it's people who are going over the top to respond to people that they perceive that are being over the top on the opposite side and they just keep pushing the envelope. In some sense, we and in the the pre-show we talked about this as well. I remarked that I you know I, I look at the modern election cycle and it's like wow this is absolutely ridiculous. And then I went and I rewatched Epic Rock Battles' uh, Romney Obama thing and this and the and we'll throw the link down below. And and I, I was watching all of the in jokes of you know the various things that were going on the forty seven percent or forty percent or women mm-hmm. in binders or you know any of those references to things that were going on and I'm like you know what I remember that these were also I, I felt that these were extreme points and then you made the comment that this election cycle has just shown that a lot of that behavior is normalized and that it's an extreme version of something that's already normalized and shifted in in, in time. There's, so I don't know I like when I think of like. I think that this election has has been like polarized implies sort of two poles, but one of your poles is in if if we're comparing candidates and 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 even I, I think supporters, one of those poles is clearly closer to the middle. I mean, the messaging in in the in the Clinton campaign has been pretty even to the point where often it's wishy washy. I mean, I'll add a link to their to their response to the the North Dakota pipeline issues that've been going on. Like specifically, um, the bit where the police closed in. Um, as of today, it was like two days ago, so it'll be about a week. Um, and and the the response, you know, the response doesn't condemn police action. It doesn't condemn you know tear gassing civilians or anything like that. It's 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 very measured and careful and and. They, they, I mean, that's consistent with a lot of the rhetoric out of that camp. Whereas, more often than not, the polarizing comments from from Donald Trump come from Donald Trump himself and are featured as literal recordings of things that he's saying. Mm-hmm. So it's not so much that they're getting pulled out of context or blown out of proportion. It's pretty hard to blow, kill the families of enemy combatants mm-hmm. out of proportion. Yeah, no, I don't mean to imply when you say polarize mm-hmm. that it implies two poles. I'm I'm referring okay. more to at least one side. The the pole like everything gets aligned stronger in that side. Like it yeah. essentially becomes more charged, right? And I don't think that both sides have to e- become equally charged. I mean, you had polarization in uh, Sanders v. Clinton, fair, right? Yeah. And you commented the incredible mental gymnastics that had to happen to to Sanders supporters when he said, look, I lost. Now it's time to endorse the person that's going to be representing our party. Mm-hmm. And it's like there was that polarization there. And I think you're right. There's a polarization of Trump, but there's also the polarization of the people, the kind of comments that, again, like the, and it's, this is the media picking up voices that don't necessarily represent the larger whole, but the people of like, like, you know, we like, we should shoot them. There's a couple of those uh, meme videos floating around last week comparing, say, the rhetoric at the the um, at a Trump's uh, rally versus civil rights footage, and mm-hmm. then what the people at the rally were saying yeah. in relation to the civil rights footage. Um, so I think Trump is one side of it, and then there's this kind of some of the voices, the more extreme hot. voices. I would go with hotbed of white supremacy. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. That's that's probably all that you need to characterize those voices. Um, yeah, and you're right that the the I think <laughs> it's almost like the entire yeah. Democratic side has gotten the memo that we don't have to push equally. Like we don't we don't have to abide by Newton's third law in this case. We don't have to push back equally hard against Trump 
they'll spiral like they're they're unstable on their own they're gonna spiral out of control in that regard like i i don't know i would like to i would like to see i i would like to see a reaction of like overweening extreme compassion from the democratic camp i think that that would <laughs> be think, that I would think, be wonderful you know what you yeah. know what what do, what is it what do you hate no we're funding that we're funding yeah, yeah. it's gonna be great yeah what is it inner yeah, inner cities is that your dog whistle of the day okay sure listen we're gonna throw so much support not just money but infrastructure yeah. education you know um professionals into into inner cities into churches in the inner cities into schools in the in in in, in the inner cities you know and, and and into black communities until until guess what you know our next 19 presidents are black deal <laughs> no you i think that would be the appropriate response yeah and you, and you a, mentioned that a, earlier is just be like you know what whatever whatever you're you, you're bigoted against we're just gonna fund things that support that because those are people who yeah. need and deserve support yeah no that would be a better solution than say what was it clinton's uh the seeming strategy of clinton in the third debate of basically rope a dope like i don't actually have to do anything for you to tire yourself out hmm like you can just keep talking. It just makes me look better. Everything you say. <laughs> so that's that. Yeah, you're you're right that there's there's a, a different side of the polarization, but it's sometimes um, lopsided polarization. Yeah, one side over the other. I will admit, um, I have like deeply mixed feels about Secretary Hillary Clinton, in the sense that, like, like, I mean. That have nothing to do with emails. Can I can I pause for just one second and pick up something before I forget? Yeah, go on, go go on go on. When we were doing the pre-show for this, you made a very good point, and I think it's something worth bearing in mind. You are enforcing upon yourself the insistence of using proper titles, mm-hmm. and I and, and that's something. And you said this like it's the same for Obama, President Obama, for Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau. I think I think you're right in that, and that's something that perhaps like I I would like to adopt that for myself as well and i probably should do better recognizing people for their appropriate titles it's not demeaning and in fact it's it's recognizing their position their office it reminds me of the west wing where it's um if i might west wing gush for a second there's there's a there's a scene where where uh where um president bartlett is is having to make a decision in terms of whether or not to um um pardon somebody last minute pardon for for the crime and he brings in uh, a priest to to get co- uh, religious consul, mm-hmm. and uh, and the priest comes in and he goes, and it's his priest, right? So he's like, should I call you Jeb or Mister President? He says, Mister President, please. And then the priest is like, okay. He's like unfurling the whatever the uh, sorry the scarf thing that he puts over top of him, uh, and he goes, don't think it's because it's a power thing. It's because I have to be reminded of what my power is in this office and the responsibility it carries. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's something I, worth bearing in mind. I think it's it's. It's for me. It, 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 I, I do. I do insist on, on addressing people by their by their titles, partly because the the tendency is to um, diminish people by excluding them. Mm-hmm. And I, I noticed that especially during the during the, the like the, the time of President Obama, uh, and I think we will likely see it again in the likely election of President Clinton. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it's also that like we refer to President Bartlett. As President Bartlett, and he's not even the real president. <laughs> so the least we can do is refer to the real person by their actual title. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so sorry to derail, but I yeah, to, yeah, I, no, I, 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 I have, but, but yeah, I have, I have deeply mixed feels about about Hillary Clinton because like she is, she is the, she is going to be the first woman to be president of the United States, almost certainly. Like from from where we sit. On this day, a week before the election, and like the, in the polls, it is almost a, a sure thing, and like that seems that is incredible. That doesn't seem incredible. That is that is incredible. Like like, I mean, 40, 45 presidents, mm-hmm. and and like Canada has never elected yeah. a woman to our highest office. Yeah. Uh, Kim Campbell was our prime minister in the nineties, mm-hmm. very briefly. But she wasn't elected. Mm-hmm. Um, it was because our old Prime Minister, Brian Mulroney, um left under a cloud. Mm-hmm. And she was our interim Prime Minister. Mm-hmm. Because in Canada, it's just the head of whatever party is in charge. 
And if that person doesn't work out, they just appoint somebody new. So, like, we, we have never done that. And I know tons of people in in America, and I know that there are tons more who are, like, so incredibly stoked to be able to vote for Hillary Clinton. Mm-hmm. And that's, like, that has to be deeply incredible. But at the same time, I, 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 and I, I mentioned this, I've mentioned this before, is that what we're, one of the things that we will see out of a, a Clinton presidency, and they have, they have sort of, you know, been firm about this, is we're going to see a presidency that supports, that offers military support, um, and, and military aid to apartheid against Palestinians, we're going to see a presidency that, while it doesn't engage in the terrifying atrocities advocated by Donald Trump, um, that being killing people's families and torture and literally things that he can be quoted saying. Mm-hmm. Um, I, it, I didn't say that. <laughs> it, no, no, no. Sorry, you got to do that in your Mike Pence voice. That's the Mike. That's the Mike Pence impression. Yeah. Um, link below to uh, the Gregory Brothers uh, Songify version of the VP debate, which is great. But no, it's it's you know it's it's a continued drone program, and it, it's it's easy it's easy to to say, and I have said in the past that you know I think that Hillary Clinton is going to do incredible things for. Uh, women's rights in America, and these are these are incredibly necessary things. Like America is a battleground for uh, women in almost every state. Like it is terrifying. I think that she's going to do lots and lots of incredible things as president. But one of the things I think that we aren't going to see, and that they have made commitments to continuing, is a foreign policy record that supports imperialism and through that support kills people around the world. Uh, And this is a thing that we would get out of any presidency. This is also a thing I should point out that we have in Canada because we also send military aid to the state of Israel um, as a nation. We just very recently, like six months ago, Closed the deal for uh, several billion dollars in weapons to Saudi Arabia. Like we are, Canada is by no means innocent in the regard of of imperialism, but it's one of those things where I have all I have met people who are very excited to vote for Hillary Clinton, and I have met people who tell me they can't vote for her because they have family in Pakistan, and I'm like that. Like both of those are very real to me. Mm-hmm. I'm like, it's 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 very quiet because it's just foreign policy. It's very far away, but you know, and it's it's standard business as usual. Mm-hmm. There isn't a single. I don't think there's a uh, maybe Gary Johnson, because Jerry Jerry does, does Gary Johnson know how maps work? I mean, like, he doesn't seem to. Well, so so he's, maybe he's not, not, not Gary he, Johnson. It might not even necessarily be maps. I think the, just the general problem is he doesn't realize that there's news going on outside of our borders. That seems fine. Let alone maps. Um, but, but yeah. I mean, but, but pretty much any, any, any major candidate, certainly in the, the, the Democratic or the Republican primaries, is, is, supports these kinds of policies. And that, like to the point where it's completely uncontroversial. Mm-hmm. And those are the, like... I find it weird to articulate support for Hillary Clinton without all without worrying about silencing those things. Mm-hmm. I mean, but at the same time, support for Donald Trump means supporting those things and worse. Mm-hmm. But I don't know that that makes it me feel better. Yeah, at this point, the hope would be um, go with uh, Hillary Clinton and then also ensure that you're you're designate to government 
you know, in that case, would it be congressman or, or is it congress? Uh, this, so this, this round is Senate. Senate. So Senate. So ensuring that your your Senate person is um, actively trying to, you know, give voice to those concerns when making decisions. Yeah, it is. I don't know. I think it's a thing that is easy to forget about. And it is it is weird to and I mean it is it is weird to think that I mean in America much like in Canada again all of our major parties also support these policies mm. uh, from the Canadian side that if you want a candidate who you know or you you want to, you want a party to vote for who, that doesn't support these policies you just that has a a snowball in hell's chance of winning you just don't have one. Mm. Like, it's just not an option. Mm. I mean, in the same way that things like anti-capitalist parties are not a cogent thing. Mm. Um, you have the high ground, but you don't have any kind of hope of... Yeah, like you, you have the high... Material, yeah. <laughs> you have the high ground, but they have all the airstrikes, and yeah. that is kind of the problem. Yeah. So... But at the same time, I mean... Probably tomorrow, the next day. I don't know when the election actually finishes up. But the first woman to be president of the United States. Mm-hmm. That is so fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember like eight years ago when it was Barack Obama who <laughs> becoming president. Mm-hmm. And there... And like the world sort of went... Explode, you know, exploded and wonderful. And I... and. You know, with the same sort of policy concerns, though. And like the, the, the opportunities for, for representation for diverse voices, the things that that's going to do to for kids that are growing up now, like, is incredible. And I look forward to seeing it. And I mean, we could also talk about Donald Trump, but I don't know that I want to. <laughs> I mean, if it, if it is going to be a losing battle, then what's the point of, of wasting any more breath on it? I just... I mean, there's nothing to say that hasn't already been said 20 times by him. He's yeah. the greatest. He's the best. He's got the best words. The cyber is so big right now. The thing I'm going to miss about Donald Trump... Um, is the moments when I allow myself to forget that he's a presidential candidate mm-hmm. in the country just to the south of me that basically not only weirdly controls the identity of my nation, but a whole bunch of our policy decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, and just allow me myself to believe that he's somebody's stupid uncle at a dinner table being like, the cyber is so big right now. It's so big. And like it's bigger, it's bigger than it's ever been. And just be like, please... Please, Uncle Don, stop talking about the cyber. Like, those are the pull quotes that I'm going to miss. Mm-hmm. You know, because they're the harmless ones. Yeah, I don't even know if I'm going to miss that. <laughs> that is, like, again, if, if I were to miss anything about this election, it would be that. But, you know, and specifically about that candidate. God. This is depressing. Let's talk about policy instead. Yeah. So, I mean, as Canadians, we don't have a lot of a stake in the American tax code. In fact, essentially none. You lived in the States for a while, but not long enough to pay taxes. Yeah, no, certainly not long enough. On account of you were a child. Yeah. I had a uh, social security number, and that was kind of the, the deepest I went because I was there for two years. I have visited America, but I have no particular desire to live there, though parts of it seem quite lovely. Mm-hmm. And there are lots of very nice and cool people there. Mm-hmm. But the things that, the, the, the places where Canada and, and America, I think, differ the most policy-wise, and the things that always come up in every election, especially this one, mm-hmm. is health care and gun control. Yeah. Gun control. Like, we have gun control here. Yeah. You can't just buy a gun. Yeah, you, I, yeah. I mean, you can't you can't have like many guns floating around you, controlled by murder thoughts. Mm. 
Yeah, but it's, it's kind of funny. Like, we were talking about it in the pre-show, and perhaps we'll dive deeper into these policy issues in future future episodes. But, um, like, we have weapons in Canada. It's not like we're a country without any yeah. weapons. Privately, privately owned weapons. But um, the pure culture that surrounds the Canadian relationship with weapons is is so so different from what you see in the states like it, it's a, a piece of identity it's enshrined in their um the bill of rights i believe is uh the de- declaration or the constitution and um it's in the second amendment yeah um well kept well kept militia yeah and bear bear arms uh, 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 there you go there's, there's your gif um but like it's it's not like we pretend we don't have weapons we do it's just the our attitude towards them is is i don't want to say radically different it's it's perhaps overstating in that regard but it's just it's so weird that when we think of guns it's like oh long gun registry what, what's, a, what's a long gun as opposed to like banning assault rifles or, or hunting with rifles that pumps out more ammunition than you could ever hope to want to hit something with. Yeah, like the, the the notion the notion of of an assault weapons ban being in, being current controversial in Canada is is mm-hmm. sort of weird. Yeah. Um, you you are you are not permitted to own assault weapons in Canada, by the way. No. Um, uh, like it's it's and and like I don't I don't want to I don't know that I can talk about it from a national identity perspective because that doesn't mean too much especially where I mean we're from southern Ontario so we do essentially dictate Canada's national identity but we are the center of Canada's universe yeah yeah I mean, ask anybody in Canada <laughs> ask anybody from the central the central provinces just just how much they love us yeah southern Ontario is wonderful um, <laughs> everyone thinks it's great here yeah but. No, but but certainly from a policy and an advocacy perspective, like even even our 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 strongest like gun toting provinces like Alberta, yeah, the, the, open the Texas, open carry is not a thing. Yeah, the Texas of, of Canada, and and is never going to be a thing. Yeah. Like short of some sort of terrifying Mad Max future, mm-hmm. like it's just it's not part of of policy, and putting it in policy just gets you laughed out of the room. You know, if you want to, if you, yeah, if you want to sink a policy faster than anything, throw throw some gun stuff on it, and that's and that is completely different. Like even, I mean, Hillary Clinton advocates, you know, gun control and, and but but also, rec- you know, uh, what was the quote from the the? Uh, I think it was the third debate. She 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 definitely recognizes the right to to individual gun ownership. Um. And uh, I believe Donald Trump's position is give everyone three guns, make them fight everyone else. But I'm paraphrasing slightly. I don't think he said that. (laughs) Well, no, no, sorry, you don't give people guns because that's a form of social service. Yeah. Uh, So, I promised I wasn't just going to rip on Donald Trump this whole episode. That's not what he pays his taxes for. Come on, Jim. He doesn't pay his taxes. No, that's the joke. He might pay us taxes. We don't know. We can't yeah. tell. Apparently, he's being the, the paperwork's in. <laughs> I'm gonna miss the the speaking style, like Lloyd, Lloyd getting the that in the epic rap battle. Yeah, all, link to more epic rap battles. All, in the, all in the, 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 all the gesticulations. That. Yeah, there's. I don't know, but I mean, in a nation of of hundreds of millions of people like the gun lobby is so is is sufficiently powerful that even your your most left-wing party has to be like no no no. buy guns own guns own 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 all the ones you all the guns you want just make sure that they're on a list Mm -hmm. and and i think that that's ultimately going to be a question i like i think the president will will set the tone for that but I think that that's going to be a question for how the Senate hmm. switches and the Senate changes up. And the other one, of course, is health care. Hmm. With, with Donald Trump advocating to go back to private insurers and, you know, sort of rep, um, repeal the Affordable Care Act and yeah. elements like that, which seem terrifying. Yeah. 
Well, and we need to make sure we're parsing out when we say healthcare. Jim is talking about the policy side of it, not the execution side of it, because that's a, that's an entirely different issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forget that that's a thing. Because for us, you, the average Canadian, when we talk about healthcare, we talk about it the the access and execution of healthcare. You know, you go to a primary care physician, or you go to a hospital. Um, the way that you get billed and whatnot. Um, like for example, my mom's a nurse in the states, and she'll sometimes complain about the healthcare my grandfather gets. If he was in the states, you know, they would have figured out what was wrong with him. You know, about X, Y, Z. Or in Canada, it's a slow process to put you on a, a wait list mm-hmm. and stuff like that. I mean, that's that's a different issue than than the straight policy of like repealing. Acts, yeah, you know, of, forcing of, insurance. I forget. I forget that that in, in the same way that I forget that hydro is not a real thing <laughs> for electricity outside of you know three hundred miles around where I live. Yeah. Um, yeah. Health three hundred miles kilometers, Jim. Listen, all right. Kilometers. I'm talking to our American viewers here. Yeah. Um, but I, I forget that uh, healthcare is not is is not synonymous with with yeah like the the sort of Having a, a a government run or a province, like in our case, a province run, mm-hmm. um, like single system, mm-hmm. it is there's 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 funding and execution and um, hospital ownership, mm-hmm. and because America has private hospitals, mm-hmm. I, I will admit that everything about that system terrifies me, even under the Affordable Care Act, mm-hmm. um, the notion that. Like, you have to be, like, I have definitely been in that position where I've been sick or I've been injured and I have been worried about being those things because I could lose my job. I can give you an anecdote about that. I can give you, like, from my personal experience. I mean, yeah. you could give an anecdote too, but I'm, I'm comfortable to share yeah, my story. Uh, when I broke my ankle two years ago... Um, and I had to get surgery on it. The first question I asked my doctor really quietly, I, I remember I was like kind of embarrassed to ask. I was embarrassed to ask because I didn't know, but I was also embarrassed to ask because it's like, how much is this going to cost me? And he's like, no, 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 the surgery's covered. You're going to pay for like the boot. And I'm like, oh, okay. But then on top of that, my I, I was a part of the short-term work cohort I was only working, I think, part-time hours. And, mm-hmm. I, and based on union rules, I wasn't allowed to work from home. And so I had the legitimate fear of if I have to recover, like if I can't even leave the house for two weeks, mm-hmm. let alone I shouldn't really be mobile out of the house for like three, maybe four weeks, depending on how I was healing, then yeah, I was my entire income source because well, I'm not going to be a bouncer for like seven weeks. I'm not going to be standing at a bar. So there's that income source gone. Yep. I was working at the college. Same deal. If I'm not being able to work for three weeks, that's money out of my pocket so yeah i mean that that's and that was my story people have it way worse with like more chronic issues Mm -hmm. or you know any kind of other factors going on like i had it pretty lucky with me so yeah like like and 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 that is that is a that is a worry and there are like economic ways to to sort of address that worry Mm -hmm. but like the fear like i don't know how to add on to that the fear that being sick or being injured mm-hmm. could cost me money. Mm-hmm. Like the thing that, it, that that whenever I talk about, you know, the ACA with 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 Americans or things like that, it's always the same. It's it's not just that I don't know how much things cost in Canada, like doctors visit. You know, I have a doctor's appointment in a couple of days, and it's you know. It's it's not a thing. It's not that I don't know how much it costs. It's that the concept of it costing something mm-hmm. is completely alien to me. It's you you like you, I understand all the words, mm-hmm. but I don't even understand where that where that would start or how that would work. Mm-hmm. So, and the notion of living under a system where that does cost just just terrifies me you know like every canadian has that story where they you know they broke their arm or they got stitches or broke their collarbone when they were a kid and the notion that the like in canada that's just like lessons lessons were learned mm-hmm. 
you know? What were you doing? Well, let me tell you, first off, I was doing something I probably shouldn't have been. Yeah. Never going to do that again. Yeah. You know, sometimes it takes more than one lesson. And it was like, maybe we don't want to play football on the roof of the garage. Well, that was a swick touchdown. <laughs> I got great air yeah. for about eight seconds. How far were you falling if it was eight seconds? <laughs> Listen. Holy crap! The laws of gravity were rewritten that day. Listen, it was very far out. Apparently. Yeah. Down a hill. Ah, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> but, uh, also, I can fly. Mmm. Spoilers for everyone. I just imagine that you have some sort of gliding squirrel capability. Yeah, yeah, basically. I just sort of. Yeah. The baggy clothes come in handy. Yeah, totally, totally, yeah. totally. You get a good, a good like fall hoodie, and you just you can go, you can go for a good eighty feet. Yeah, feet, feet for our American audience. That's <laughs> we're international. Yes, but no, it's it's and the no, but the notion that those are those are more than funny stories. Mm-hmm. Um, like just, just I can't I can't identify that feeling because I've never had it. Mm-hmm. Um. I every time somebody talks to me about it, I just want to like hug them, and I do, I can't even be like, well, well, there's a better way of doing it. They know. <laughs> Canada doesn't even have the best way of doing it. Yeah, like it's hard for us because it's province run and our country's really big. Yeah, which means it takes a, like everybody's spread out and it takes a whole bunch of infrastructure. Yeah. Um. Yeah, infrastructure that's not there. Yeah. Well, not there for the remote communities. Especially for, yeah, for yeah. for rural communities. Yeah. And, like, on top of that, I mean, you've got things like privately owned hospitals. We'll do, I'll throw a link into uh, uh, Samantha B. did a segment on, on Catholic-run hospitals and, and procedures they won't perform. Mm-hmm. CR aforementioned comments about the United States being a battleground for women's rights. Hmm. Yeah, it, I worry. <laughs> yeah. But this section, this section is far too dense to cover in this podcast, and we are coming up on like forty minutes. Yeah, so. yeah, it's and it's also um, for like. We're not really interrogating their their healthcare policies no. so much as the healthcare system in general. For a, for a deeper look at their healthcare policies, uh, I'll throw some links in the show notes to John Green did an analysis of each candidate's healthcare policies, and I'm pretty sure Healthcare Triage mm-hmm. did a deeper dive. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll put some links in the show notes to those, um, so that maybe you can watch them before you go out and vote. So, how do you think this election is going to affect Canada? I mean, for real, like we are from Canada. How, how does this? How do you think this election, the outcome of the election, one way or another? Let us assume that anything is possible at this point. Um, coming from a slightly, slightly uninformed position, um, I can't really see it materially affecting us because it, it is a different country. <laughs> I mean, there's going to be there's going to be some policy relations and whatnot. Depending on which candidate gets voted in, there there'll be a closer or a more cold connection. Mm-hmm. You know, like the 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 kind of buddy cop scenario of Justin or Prime Minister <laughs> Justin Trudeau and President uh, Barack Obama, right? Like it makes for good headlines and it makes for good cooperation. But they're both running incredibly large countries, so it's not like they're collaborating on the next you know hottest album that they're going to drop together, right? The, so I don't know. President Obama's going to have a bunch of free time. Yeah, well, he'll be able to sleep in on the occasional Sunday. I don't think he's going to have more free time. I think he's just going to have less responsibility. Fair. <laughs> he's going to have uh, his, the the rate at which he's developing gray hairs is going to start to slow down a yeah. little bit, I think. What about the Canadian identity? Um, I think you brought up a good point. This is not my idea. This is kind of what you brought up. That mirror effect. It's going to hold up... A, uh, I think... Um, if, if Hillary Clinton is elected president, I don't think it's going to have as deep of a mirror effect because it is more status quo with what we're used to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think you brought up an interesting idea that if Donald Trump gets elected president, it forces a reflection on ourselves, 
holds a mirror up in terms of this is what he says about things about Canada. Um, how does that gel with how we actually operate? Sorry, he says he says things uh, that are going on in the states, or he's affected. He he affects things, but how does that gel with how we handle things? Yeah, I mean, a, a huge a huge part of the Canadian identity is I think separating ourselves from Americans, mm-hmm. and I mean we're because considering that we're all part of North America, and the United States of America got got the title of Americans, which I mean, I, I guess you know I mean no matter how much that pisses people in Canada off. I bet it pe- pisses people in Mexico off even more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there's there's a sense in which like that is that is how we we define ourselves. And yeah, I, I think that Donald Trump forces us to look deeper into that mirror. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas under under a Clinton presidency, in the same way that we have done under an Obama presidency, in the same way that we did over the under the Bush presidency, we managed to sort of maintain the status quo that allows us to consistently back um you know let's uh, it's morally damaging foreign policy while maintaining the the rhetoric of no matter what we do it's not as bad as what as as what the Americans are doing with with their imperialism mm-hmm. um and I think I think the a Clinton presidency would would invite more of that same rhetoric, but a Trump presidency with all of its terrifying trash fires and at risk people, um, would I think push us to look further and 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 ask us what we're doing about our at risk populations. And our marginalized and our marginalized voices. And I have a final question that we didn't put in the show notes, which is, what do you think that supporters are going to do when the elec- uh, with the, uh, the election outcome? I mean, one of the big things with this election has been: is the Republican Party going to acknowledge the results, and specifically the Republican candidate Donald Trump? And and the you know there have been supporters who, you know, are clamor are clamoring for revolution in the face of a Clinton presidency. You mean treason. Mm. <laughs> some Six of and the, one half dozen some of, the, some of the rhetoric is, is very close to, to suggesting treason. Um, what do I think? Um, you decide treason after your civil war. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the victors get to write history in that regard. Um... Again, I don't want to. St- Maybe you should go first. So I don't steal your idea because I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna parrot, uh, parrot something that you said when we were preparing a couple of days ago. Yeah, I don't know. I, I like recently with, with Joe Walsh tweeting about how he's gonna grab his musket. Yeah. And when he says that though, I can't. I don't know if he is being serious and making a reference to the glorious revolution, or if he's being somewhat facetious by calling it a musket. Like, I'm, I'm not sure how to how to come Listen, down. Listen, you can on name that. your penis whatever you want. It's not a big deal. Yeah, uh, Gilbert. But, anyways, um, I don't I, I don't know enough about Joe Walsh to be able to to adjudicate whether or not he's being serious, facetious, playful, or whatnot. Uh, what what he's saying is still kind of bad. But, um, like, how do you respond to something like that when somebody says? You know, take up your muskets, young lads, and let's go off to war. Yeah, I mean, but it's it's that I think it's that sort of sentiment of of, and I think it taps into the notion of that there there is a deep sort of vein of of discontent and disenfranchisement. Mm-hmm. Um. But at the same time, I think that over the past over the past even two years, we have seen which groups of you know Americans and and Canadians as well are willing to actually take to the streets like like rubber hits the road mm. if you are going to grab your musket you have to grab your musket and march out into the street and make a lot of noise and and we have seen who is marching mm-hmm. black lives matter is marching yeah. first nations people are marching yeah like you know queer people are marching yeah 
marginalized groups are marching and they're 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 marching i guess because yeah, i mean it is march or die mm -hmm. in in many very real case uh, cases um and, and senses which is the actual word that i meant to go to the end of that sen sentence yeah. but i mean i think that they're gonna like these are people who are who are as somebody who who you know talks a lot on uh, a lot of smack on twitter uh, myself, I think that these are people who talk a lot of smack on the internet, mm -hmm. and they're gonna go to the like they go to Donald Trump rallies and they go to, the, to and then they're gonna go back to doing exactly what they were doing before. No, they're not under threat. They're you know they're gonna sit around and simmer, mm -hmm. and uh, if all you're gonna do to maintain your oppression is complain about stuff on Facebook while other people in in marginalized groups are actually doing the work mm -hmm. i mean sure keep on keeping on you know what like obviously don't do that instead get out and demonstrate anti-racism but mm -hmm. you know what if that's the limit of your 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 ability to to maintain you know the the, the dominant culture cool no you know what i don't care yeah no and that's why i wanted you to go first because <laughs> It's more or less when you said that it's it just makes sense to me. Yeah, the, the the people, yeah, they're showing up to rallies and stuff like that because there's some solidarity there. But when uh, when the the ballot eventually gets cast and and as I predict, I'm pretty sure Hillary Clinton will win the presidency. The disenfranchised Trump supporters, I don't know. The Tea Party didn't really like they they got a little bit more politically active and whatnot, but. Mm -hmm. um, nothing really happened i don't think it's so polarized that they would legitimately try to violently overthrow or violently uh, protest it um well i think the distinction is they know i mean they they understand at some at some level they are not actually under threat no the hillary the, the like the, the 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 regime of of president hillary clinton is not going to come to their house and take their guns it is not going to, what it is going to do is try and lift up other Americans. And if you are a person who has a problem with that, then I guess go fuck yourself. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, that that's, keep, stick to Facebook where I guess you like to hang out and, you know, and the Facebook pages you enjoy. Yeah. Pretty much at that, after that point, after the election, then it's just going to be four years or two and a half years when you really even think about it with how long their election cycles are of people making memes of not supporting the candidate. That's what I see with a lot of people <laughs> in my feed and whatnot who don't like uh, Justin Trudeau as prime minister, guy Kathleen Wynne as premier of like, look at what they're doing. Who's with me to support a conservative party or Republican party. You know what I mean? Like it's those, those kinds of things pop up in the aftermath mm -hmm. and that's, that's their version of protest. Um, recently, uh, I got turned back onto um, the little segment from Theodore Roosevelt's speech, the 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 man in the arena. Basically, don't take don't don't. Links in the show notes. Yeah, I want to end up buying a book of his letters and whatnot just because of this section because I want to read more of his, of his speeches. By the way, this excerpt from the 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 man in the arena speech this is like a ten thousand word speech. Yeah, the Roosevelt don't mess around. No. What happened to, like, uh, th thankfully they went away because who the hell's got a, the attention span to handle that? It was like 20, I copied and pasted because I was curious how many pages it was. It was like 21 pages when I copied and pasted it. And it's not like the text was enlarged, but anyways. Listen, they didn't have, they didn't have cat memes back then. No. You had to go and look at actual cats. <laughs> little, little top hats and monocles. Um uh, but uh, basically the, the point of, of the references is don't take the critics seriously. Take the person who's in the arena who's marred with, with blood, sweat, and dirt and whatnot. And I think there's something to be said about that, that there are so many people who criticize and are vocal online, um, but they don't hold a candle to the people who are actually out, you know, uh, putting their bodies in harm's way or putting their well-being ahead. Or sorry. Putting other people's futures ahead of their own well-being. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think the Trump supporter archetype has that kind of character in them to, to translate their dissatisfaction within, into some sort of action. 
I think that the 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 structural like, like structural structural racism and, and misogyny has them transforming their dissatisfaction into action all the time, but not in a sense of like yeah organizing in solidarity. Mm. Um, no, usually it's uh, casual indifference and neglect, and then and taking advantage of a system that benefits them. So we're gonna go and continue watching your country, uh, and and the United States of America um, with bated breath and hoping that everybody makes a choice. Um, I, I will, I will maybe catch some, some flack for saying this, but I think everybody should go and vote. And I, I have written an article in the past that was, that was, here are good reasons why you should not go and vote. Mm -hmm. Um, like here are, there are lots of good reasons to not vote, but I think that no matter how disenfranchised you, you feel in, in the United States, in any election in the United States, you need to go and vote, even if you don't want to vote for president, mm. because there's a whole bunch of down ticket initiatives. Like everybody gets elected, judges and sheriffs and county clerks, and mm -hmm. there's there's ballot initiatives on on there, and that stuff matters. And even if you can't support a candidate for president, it seems perfectly reasonable. You can support candidates for those other things, and you can be a part of those other decisions, which will affect your community. Mm -hmm. And there, like there are, there are ballot initiatives on there that can make your community safer or healthier or can damn it. Mm -hmm. And those are important things to do um, to go and vote. So yeah, um, but I'll still link the article down below, just because I mean. In Canada, we don't have any of that stuff. We elect, like, three positions. No. Ever. Well, five. Well, no, no, five. No. At, the, at the local level, it's a little different. Yeah. Local, local we do three. Um, Mayor, councillor, school board. Yeah, I guess it would be three. And then provincial, one. And federal, one. We don't even vote for our prime minister. America is so weird. Or maybe we're weird. Sure, maybe that. I don't know. Anyway, we will watch your country with bated breath. And, uh... I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. We're signing off. Stay awesome. God, that was real hard. That was... I think that is one of the hardest podcasts we have ever done. In what sense? For, for me. I don't know. There's a sense... Because there's a sense in which I want to be like... Hillary Clinton is the most qualified person for the job, and she is going to do the work. And that is 100% true. Mm -hmm. um, like She is going to bring an unheard of level of commitment to that position. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like in the face of those foreign policy consequences, I don't feel good saying that. Which is why this is in the outro. Mm-hmm.